So I hope your coffee break was productive and you enjoyed the exhibition. We are now moving to the second part and the last part of our opening session. And uh, I promise you it's going to be a very exciting one. Uh, we will have a keynote address and before I invite Dr. Shiva to come to the stage, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, Dr. Vandana Shiva is trained as a physicist. She did her PhD on the subject, hidden variables and non-locality in quantum theory. I don't know how many of you could have understood what the PhD is about, but uh, I did a bit of research and I can promise you it is fascinating. She did it at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. She later shifted to interdisciplinary research in science, technology, and environmental policy, where she carried out, that she carried out at the Indian Institute of Science and the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. In 1982, she founded an independent institute, so her own institute, the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology in Dehradun, dedicated to high quality and independent research to address the most significant ecological and social issues of our time. She did this in very close partnership with local communities and social movements. I think by now you can see the link to our global movement of cooperatives. In 1991, she founded Nadva, Nad, Navdanya, a national movement to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources, especially nat native seed and the promotion of organic farming and fair trade. In 2004, she started uh, Bija Vidya Peace, she'll excuse me for the, present, for the pronunciation, an international college for sustainable living in Dune Valley in collaboration with Schumacher College. As you will see, she combines the sharp intellectual inquiry with courageous activism. Time magazine identified Dr. Shiva as an environmental hero in 2003. Asia Week has, Asia Week has called her one of the five most powerful communicators of Asia. Forbes magazine in November 2010 has identified Dr. Shiva as one of the top seven most powerful women on the globe. <laughs> Dr. Shiva has received multiple honorary doctorates from University of Paris, University of Western Ontario, University of Oslo, Connecticut College, and so many other more. She's received many awards, including the Alternative Nobel Prize, Right Livelihood Award in 1993, and many orders. I think I cannot do justice to the number of prizes and awards that Dr. Shiva has received in her professional lifetime. One that is definitely worth noting, because it's very relevant to this conference, is the Midori Prize for Biodiversity in 2016, the Virangana Award in 2018, the Sanctuary Wildlife Award in 2018, and the International Environment Summit and Award 2018. Now, I think we all agree that she deserves to be the keynote speaker for a very special conference. Help me welcoming Dr. Vandana Shiva. You're most welcome, ma'am. It's a pleasure for me to join you, the cooperative movement of the world, because my science has taught me that cooperation and interconnectedness and non-separability and non-locality is the way the world works, even at the quantum level. And my five decades of ecological work has taught me simple little things that the textbooks do not tell us. They make us believe that the soil is an empty container when it's a rich ecosystem of billions and trillions of organisms. Ecology is the science of the cooperation of nature. And as over the years, we have conserved biodiversity, evolved the organic agriculture movement, built the farm, which is both 
a learning farm, a teaching farm, a research farm, and I hope some of you will visit us to strengthen this cooperation better. We have watched how nature cooperates, how we would not get seed if the bees did not pollinate our crops. We've done research how one third of the food we eat is provided by pollinators. You spray poisons, you kill the pollinators, you're already losing your food and you're losing a very important species which now the UN has assessed is about $169 billion worth of contribution. Those are the economies not counted. When we take into account cooperation in nature, cooperation of humans with nature, and cooperations of humans with each other, that is the true economy. The word economy is derived from the same word, oikos. Oikos is our home. It's the Greek word for our home. And the management of this home is economy. The science and knowledge of how the home works is ecology. The two are rooted in the same word oikos. But today, we've evolved an economy, I call it an economy that's gone rogue. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Rwanda has elephants. I grew up in the forests of India, where the rogue elephant was the one who left the community. The poor rogue elephant forgot how to cooperate. And then they become destructive. Aristotle defined economy as economia, the art of living. And he had another word for what is today called the economy, the art of money making at any cost. At any cost to nature, at any cost to society, this is what has led to the various ecocides and the various genocides. It is the art of limitless greed that does not know when to stop. And it does not have any values to guide the use of instruments, except for how to make more money. We just have to see the figures. In 2010, there were 388 billionaires controlling as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity. This number dwindled to 177 in 2011, to 150 in 2012, to 92 in 2013, to 80 in 2014, to 62 in 2015, shriveling to a mere eight in 2016, and five in 2017. This is not an economy. This is plunder. Those of us who come from countries that were colonized saw exactly this phenomena. When out of the blue maps were drawn, extraction started, and we were left dispossessed of our own land, our own wealth, our own resources. My country dropped from 25% of the world economy to 2% at the end of British colonialism. And for Africa, Proud communities caught as slaves to pick cotton in the cotton empire. And every time the narrative is told, England became rich because of its textile industry, I said, no, 200 years before, it plundered. It plundered the land of North America. It plundered the people of Africa. It plundered my land. That is not economy. It's a wrong model. Colonization and extractivism is a wrong model of the, how the economy should work and can work. We are on one planet and we have an ancient text that says this universe and this earth is meant for all beings. Because in India we've never believed in anthropocentrism. We've never believed that the world is for humans alone. And I think most indigenous African cultures recognize 
that the earth is for all beings. And those are worldviews we need to regenerate because they're always, always worldviews of cooperating with nature. And the Sisha Upanishad carries on to say, enjoy the gifts of the earth without greed. And do not take others' share because taking the share of others is theft. So I would add that Aristotle's crematistics, the art of money making, ends up being the art of stealing. It ends up being the star art of grabbing. Of course, there's theft from nature. And as Gandhi said, nature has enough for everyone's needs, but not for a few people's greed. The, as the number of billionaires and trillionaires shrinks, the threat to the planet increases. And now the IPCC has warned us that if we don't change the way we run our economies, primarily now based on fossil fuels, in, within 12 years, humanity has no future. In 100 years, we'll go extinct like others. The 200 species going extinct every day. And I, I know a few years ago, I'm on the World Future Council, and there was an award given to Rwanda for its amazing work in conservation. But my bigger tribute to Rwanda, and the, I was so happy that this conference was here, is because while peaceful societies are descending into genocide, Rwanda emerged from a very contrived imposed genocide to be the society of cooperation and justice that it is today. So thank you, Rwanda, thank you. But if you look at the theft from nature, rapid expansion and thus sustainable management of land is the most extensive global direct driver of land degradation. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services with negative impact on the well-being of at least 3.2 billion people. The degradation of the Earth's land surfaces through human activities is pushing the planet towards a sixth mass extinction. Across the world, the insects, including the pollinators that we took for granted, have started to disappear. It's being called an insectigodon. And it's all happened in the last 25 years as industrial agriculture, chemical farming, and poisons in farming, all of which came from the wars, all of which came, have their roots in making gases for the concentration camps to kill people. They are weapons of mass destruction. And we've turned them into agrochemicals for food production. And that's why, of course, species are disappearing. But people are dying. I began looking at agriculture in 84 when the state of Punjab, where I had done my MSc honors in physics, erupted in violence. And that same year, the city of Bhopal became the site of a pesticide plant leaking. And, and the people of Bhopal called that a genocide. 7,000 people died immediately. Even now, children are being born crippled. 75% birds have disappeared because birds need insects. And years ago, Rachel Carson tried to wake us up through Silent Spring on what we were doing to the planet. We are literally sleepwalking to our own extinction. And this threat from nature now has really become a survival threat, not just for humanity, but for all species. But this theft, by taking more than your share, is also a theft from others. The earth gives us enough water for everyone to have pure, clean drinking water. The earth does not create polluted streams. I have grown up in the mountains of Himalaya, drinking water from the streams and the rivers. And it's only about 25 years ago the water became undrinkable. This became the way we quench our thirst. This is a symptom of the fact that we have violated nature and we have violated the rights of people to water.
A billion people are going without water. A billion people are hungry. And the FAO's recent study where they added an indicator and said, let's add the vulnerable. How many people are worried they won't be able to eat for the next week? That became two billion. And for them, the surprising thing was that among the two billion were rich countries. The food deserts of the richest country of the world, America. I say, how can a country call itself rich if, it's, if her people are starving? The right to food, the right to water, the right to clean air, the right to life has to be the indicator of doing well. The word wealth is derived from the word well-being. And we've somehow made the indicator of wealth, the justification for destroying the well-being of the planet, the well-being of other species, the well-being of most of our fellow citizens. But we don't just steal from others. We steal from the future, because the future has a right to share. And sustainability for me is nothing more than ensuring the Earth's gifts for the future that our rivers flow, that our atmosphere can manage and regulate the climate. People forget that the atmosphere is not disconnected from the biosphere. And in fact, the biosphere is what has created the atmosphere, as James Lovelock, the NASA scientist, found. And he evolved models on how is it that the Earth maintains her climate temperature and her seasons to perfection? He realized she was self-organized and a living system. That's why he called her Gaia, and this became the Gaia hypothesis. And of course, in the West, it took a love lock to remember that the Earth is living. But in all of our cultures, we know the Earth is living, she's our mother. We have to take a permission every time we do something. And we have to take the permission of the seventh generation to come. I know in India, that's how we think. Take a step if you know it will benefit the seventh generation to come. And if you know it will harm them, don't take that step. This is the same as what the Native Americans Think of the seventh generation test. And because the seventh generation test has been violated, we have the young people striking on Fridays and saying, you have stolen our future. I see the cooperative movement as bridging all of these divides and transcending the artificial constructions of separation, of atomization, of competition as the natural way in which the world is organized and human societies can organize. Cooperation is our very being. We wouldn't exist if the trees did not take the carbon dioxide we emit and convert it into oxygen so we can breathe. We would not exist if the soil did not give us all the micronutrients and trace elements that go into our food. We wouldn't exist without the sunshine. We wouldn't exist without the bees and the butterflies. We wouldn't exist without the fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi that are only in organic soils and are killed in chemically farmed soils. But in a cubic inch of soil, you can have eight miles of this fungi. And it can travel to a very different part of a field or a forest to find the nutrients and bring it to the plant that needs it. If even the fungi know justice and fairness is the way we live, surely humans be, should be able to learn as much. 
It's now being called the, the web of the fungi under the soil is being called the, the soil wide web. Much more complex, many more interactions than the world wide web of the internet. We get very excited about every new communication system we set up only because we became dumb about understanding the true communication that's going on in nature and between people. We've just finished a one-month training we do on uh, agroecology and living food systems and living economies built on living food systems. And uh, we cover living seed, living soil, living food, living economies. And this time around, we had at least three young people who were on the trajectory to do artificial intelligence, to do mechanical uh, machine learning, and they've left to say, I have to do more with my life because we've shrunk the idea of intelligence, which means to understand and to know, into artificial intelligence, which is downloaded into a machine, and we've forgotten our cooperative intelligence, which is what makes cooperatives work, which is what makes communities work. We've forgotten our ecological intelligence that allows us to know how to function properly on the earth. It has totally degraded emotional intelligence which women have kept alive through their economies of care and which I believe is what allowed Rwanda to regenerate herself. Without that emotional intelligence, the artificially imposed conflicts would have become permanent cleavages in society. We have forgotten the compassionate intelligence that is so deeply cultivated in our cultures. I mean, Buddhism is nothing more than the practice and elevation of compassionate intelligence. To know that the world is living, that all beings are sentient beings, and to not do harm to others is the highest level of evolution of humanity. So we are into beings because if we don't forget our relationship with, our, with others, we cultivate those relationships. We are part of the earth and we are earth citizens. We are members of societies and communities and we are part of cultivating the commons. There's a beautiful new word that has entered the discourse. It's called commoning. Recognizing the common interest and cultivating it. And I believe that's what cooperatives are doing. Because they work for the common interest and for the common good. But because of colonialism on the one hand and then through 300 years of fossil, fossil fuel based industrialism, um, mechanical thinking, the economy of greed, We've been made to believe the opposite is true. We've been made to believe we are atoms, inert and separate. And Margaret Thatcher put this in words. She said, there is no society, there are only individuals. And if she was alive today, she'd say, no, there aren't even individuals. There's only your, your behaviors to be mined by Facebook, to be then sold and traded as the new commodity. You must ask, why are the 10 richest people, those who deal with other people's money and put it on the global casino, and those who are carving out colonies out of our minds? It's the new colonization. It's the new threat to autonomy and sovereignty. We are repeatedly being told as individuals we are separate from and superior to nature. This is the disease of anthropocentrism. It is also the disease of the new disease of superior races all over the world. Suddenly they have emerged. I mean, I knew, I know through colonization 
There was a group that called themselves civilized and called us barbarians and trashed us. And uh, they knew civilizing missions, but that false idea of superiority is coming back to, to basically justify new genocidal thinkings in our societies and new exclusions and new intolerances. We are not separate from nature. We are all earthlings. We might be a different shape from the mycorrhizal fungi. We might have different functions from the bees and butterflies, but from the microbes to the elephant and us in between, we are earth citizens with equal rights and an equal right to have a future. But we can only have it if we ensure that we live in ways, we produce in ways, we consume in ways, there's enough left for the earth to continue to have her atmosphere clean and therefore her climate stable, her soils fertile and not desertified, her biodiversity rich, her rivers flowing clean. This separatism that has so infected the way we think about ourselves and therefore the way we think about economy. So it says, as atomized individuals, we are separate from each other and can only compete for scarce resources. Even scarcity itself is constructed because my work over five decades has totally reconfirmed Gandhi's teaching that the earth has enough for everyone's needs, but not for a few people's greed. I think what the cooperatives are doing are showing how we can create enough through our creative work for all. That greed creates an economy of scarcity and then creates conflicts between people. And while the idea of competition is imposed as if it brings efficiency, I have watched how the idea of competition, especially through the corporate designed free trade, does the opposite. There is no competition in the corporate businesses. They become bigger and bigger and bigger concentrations and cartels and bigger monopolies. The field in which I work, seed, most of our seeds were in farmers' hands, but even in the industrialized West, there were small seed companies all over. Today, Bayer has bought Monsanto, Syngenta has merged with ChemChina, and Dow has merged with DuPont, and they control 60 to 70 percent of the agrochemicals and the seeds. And they write the laws, including the attempt to own life on grounds that they have invented the seed. I said, no, you don't invent the seed. We receive the seed from nature and our ancestors. You modify the seed. And how you modify it should be assessed. Do you do good or do you do bad? If you had a toxic gene, according to the biosafety laws, I've had this role in framing for the United States and nations. We, when you modify in ways that harms biodiversity, that harms the soil, that harms our public health, and harms the socioeconomic condition of farmers, you actually shouldn't be rewarded at all. In, in ecology, we have a principle called the polluter should pay. You put a toxic gene into food, you're polluting the food. You need to be regulated. Such a huge rush for deregulation. Even poor you know, our empire, England, that little island nation. And Gandhi had said, we cannot follow the British model because if a little island nation would put the whole world in chains, can you imagine what will happen if we follow that path of greed for resources and control over other people? That's why we needed another path. But little England, and all this theater going on on Brexit is only because Europe has regulations. It has food safety regulations, it has fire safety regulations, and poor Boris Johnson, the best he can say about Brexit is we'll get chlorinated chicken. 
and we liberate the GMO. And that's when things start to go wrong, where that which is put in place to regulate for the public good and the protection of the planet is seen as an interference in the freedom of the 5%, or as I call it, the 1%. I have a new book called Oneness Versus the 1%. Because I believe that the reality of our humanity is we are connected. The reality of the planet is everything is related. We live in a web of life. Nothing is separate. The reality of the fictions is everything separate, and we'll separate you even more. And if it looks like you are waking up to your ability to organize and produce yourself, we'll find a new way to pass a new law to make you illegal. Now, Gandhi gave us an amazing, a very, very powerful instrument of satyagraha, which means the force of truth. And when he was asked, how did you come up with it? He says, I didn't come up with it. I just watched closely how India had stayed democratic and how people had retained their power. That when they were dissatisfied with their rulers, they did not cooperate. And this happened in 18 something when the British wanted to collect taxes from the homes of Banaras, the oldest city. And they said, pay taxes to us. And the inhabitants said, but you didn't build these homes. How can you demand taxes? And of course, the British weren't going to listen. So what Banaras did was empty out the city. He said, okay, collect the rents from an empty city. And the British were forced to withdraw the rule, just as they were forced to withdraw, eventually, the salt tax, which made salt making illegal in India. You know, when you're in tropical countries, you need salt. And Gandhi led the salt march and went to Dandi Beach and picked up the salt from the sea and said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make salt. We will not obey your laws. So when the corporations were telling us that everyone would have patented seed, all farmers anywhere would buy their seeds from, at that time they were saying we'd be five companies, but now they're three. Um, I said, no, we'll do a seed satyagraha. We said, you don't invent the seed, nature gives it. Our ancestors have bred it. We need it to grow the food. And therefore, we will not obey your laws. I, we've gone further in India. We've not allowed seeds and plants and life to be patented. And I hope everywhere. I know, I know Africa is under huge assault to impose corporate intellectual property laws. And I, I get letters from little countries to saying they've just made seed exchange illegal between us. That is what Gandhi did his Satyagraha for. But he began his Satyagraha actually in Africa. Because when the apartheid regime was being put in place, one of the first things that was done was compulsory registration on the basis of race. And Gandhi said, but we are one citizenry. We are equal human beings. We will not be divided by race. And they had a bonfire of these passes that were required on the basis of race. And he went to jail in South Africa. It was interestingly, on another 9-11, we call it the 9-11 of peace in 1906. Then of course he came back to India and so much of our ability to see that we have the power to organize. We have the power to be together. We have the power to have solidarity, and we have the power to recognize unjust, brutal laws to protect greed from laws that protect the common good. And I do believe that each of us has a duty to not obey laws that give immunity to greed at the cost of the planet and the cost of people's welfare and the, and the future, because we are literally, from every scientific evidence that's been laid before us, 
we are looking at a hundred years of human survival if we continue on this path of greed and the path of pseudo-competition which leads to monopoly. I mean, if you just look at any sector, look at the numbers controlling the global system. This model should be dismantled just on grounds of antitrust. Whether it's the technology giants or the fast clothing giant who are throwing away clothes by the day just to sell the next and the next, or the junk food diets that are responsible for 75% of all chronic diseases, which used to be called the diseases of the rich because industrial food was only in the rich countries, but now as it's being exported to our countries, we are getting diabetes, we are getting cancers, we are getting all kinds of chronic diseases which have become the the single biggest reason for death today, two billion people are affected by food-related diseases. And if you look at climate change, I have a book, Soil Not Oil, in which I assessed what's the global junk food system. And when I call it a junk food system, I mean you produced it in ways that is nutritionally empty because you use chemicals that didn't allow the crop to have nutrition because the soil had no nutrition. But it's also junk because the processing empties it out of anything healthy and puts in all kinds of hazardous material. So the production of this industrial system is, accounts for 11 to 15% of all greenhouse gases contributing to climate change. It's also leading to deforestation and land use change. We're burning the Amazon to grow GMO soya and spray Roundup. Argentina has been devastated by becoming the supplier of GMO soya when it used to be the exporter of wheat before this current phase of corporate globalization. Today, Argentinians are standing in lines for food when they had no food scarcity. 15 to 20% of the greenhouse gases come from destroying our forests. When we could be protecting our forests, protecting wildlife, protecting biodiversity, and growing more food, that's the work we've done. We don't need to import all our food from 10,000 miles away. India was the land which actually triggered colonialism because the East India Company was created, as the name tells you, to colonize India. And the reason they wanted to control India is we had spices, we had beautiful textiles. And those were the main things traded. But we weren't trading in our staple food. We were trading in high value items. I call it the spice of life trade. Small volumes of high value go long distance, but large volumes of what everyone needs is the economies we need to grow locally, so that not only do all hands have work through cooperatives, but all people have their needs met for clothing, for shelter, for food, and that's what you're doing. The processing transport packaging, 15 to 20%, when we could have better food with local artisanal processing, local manufacture, and just a few things distant, traveling long distance. Coffee and tea, yes, can't grow in Europe. But if Europe can have its cheeses, it should. Waste, two to four percent. Now in ecological systems and circular systems, there is no waste. Nature knows no waste. In small communities, there's no waste. Because what you won't eat, you give to the animal. The rest goes to compost, it goes into your field, it goes to feed your soil organisms. When you're intimate, the needs of all can be met. But what we have right now is a huge competition between an extractivist economy that takes the last drop of water from rivers, the last bit of fertility from soils, the last bit of value 
from communities. And this extraction is then going to the top, creating this pyramid. But the pyramid now is becoming an inverted pyramid because there's too much on the top. Particularly finance, which is 70 times more than the real economy of the world. The fictitious economy, I don't think cooperative banks deal in fictitious finance. But the investment funds and the investment banks, that's all they do. And they trade in risk, so the more, I, I remember in 2008, when the collapse took place, the financial collapse took place, there were these ads about how hunger, um, I, I know their uh, co colleagues from Egypt, but the, the marches in Egypt were bread riots. They were about the price of bread. And because the price of bread was becoming unreachable for ordinary people, those who had been in the financial world said, wow, we can now invest in two new things, food and land. And, don't, and make lots of money out of this. So food today has become part of the global casino. People's land has become part of the global casino. And it is so important that your efforts, your contributions are bringing justice and sustainability back in this casino economy. How do we make this change? The system is so powerful. But you know, an upside down pyramid is a highly unstable pyramid. It can topple any time, and it is. The fact that in country after country, we are seeing instability. If you open the newspaper, all you see is riots in every country. Ecuador used to be so good. Austerity policies have made people come to the streets. They had to withdraw the law yesterday. Austerity basically is another extractive mechanism. Take society's share to allow it to come to the top. We have to begin where we are, wherever you are in your cooperatives. I saw when the, uh, the screen was up, I saw the slogan of co-op is elevate your identity. And I believe if all you do is elevate your identity from being just community to earth community, you've brought sustainability right into it. And the Spanish cooperative slogan, humanity at work. Well, humanity has been at work and we are on this fragile moment where the billionaires are thinking of new money through putting people out of work. After all, the fossil fuel definition of efficiency was always how you can get rid of people. How can you get rid of people? And my critique of industrial farming has been, you didn't grow more food. All you did was grow food with less people, and that's not efficiency. People are not an input. People are the heart of the economy. You can't treat them as an input that must be reduced to make the system more efficient. I've had debates on how they, they're supposed to be mere denominators. Reduce the denominator. And so you get more hunger because you've thrown more farmers out of work. And half of the hungry of the world today are rural people because you're taking their livelihoods away from them. And I've never understood, why do you need tractorless? A driverless tractors. Why do you need driverless cars? I thought we had realized that automobile culture wasn't the best way to go forward. I came from o Copenhagen, where 70% of the mobility is cycles. Now, if I ride a bicycle, I'm not going to look for a driverless car. I've made my society driverless because everyone is cycling, and they've changed the sense of thinking your status in society is associated with the ownership of a car and the most expensive one at that. No, our identity has to be how much do we give back?
That is mutuality. That is solidarity. How much do we give back to the earth? How much do we give back to society? And just two principles of ecology have guided my work. The first principle is the principle of diversity. Nature does not know monocultures. Nature does not know superiority. The small herb in the forest and the giant tree are the same. And the second is the law of circularity, the law of recycling, the law of return. That's how we have built Navdanya. And while I began the movement just to save seeds in our biodiversity and the integrity of creation and the integrity of life, we've encouraged our farmers to do farming like their grandfathers and grandmothers did it, with biodiversity. You have biodiversity, you don't need chemicals. You have biodiversity, you don't need chemical fertilizer. The biodiversity gives you the soil fertility. You have good biodiversity, you don't need pesticides because the pest predator relationship between different plants manages the insect population, which controls your pests. You can totally get rid of all chemicals through biodiversity. But we, just let, we said, let's measure the productivity. Let's take all the things that grow and then all the nutrition that grows with biodiversity. And we found that with biodiversity intensification, we can feed two times India's population using the land that we're using currently. We don't need to have every second child severely malnourished and every fourth Indian hungry. And I'm sure this would be the case for Africa. Indigenous agroecology systems with biodiversity. And when the hands are there, in our uh, region up in the Himalaya, we have, Navdanya means nine seeds. These are nine crops together. We have 12 crops together. When we work with love on our small farm, hands are the way you can pick this crop now and that crop later. It's when you have the giant combined harvester and the horrible spraying that you need big scale. But as the FAO has shown us, 80% of the food we eat comes from small farms. Only 20% comes from large industrial farms. And if we were to increase the industrial farms, we will have a very dead planet. Because not only is 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions coming from industrial farming, 75% of the soil destruction 75% of the water destruction uses 10 times more water to grow the same amount of food. And 90% of the biodiversity extinction is coming from the system. We put biodiversity at the center and we've managed to put more carbon back in the soil. We managed to have more regeneration of nitrogen. We can actually reverse climate change through biodiversity intensification of our forests and our farms. We're growing more food. But the issue, you know, the, our government kept debating with me, but we, you know, we need industrial farming for the economic growth of farming and our welfare of our farmers. So we said, let's do a true cost accounting. And the agriculture minister wrote the forward to our book. We call it Wealth Per Acre. The other one is called Health Per Acre. And in the wealth per acre, we found the externalities of industrial chemical farming are $1.3 trillion annually for India alone. And that's only ecology and society. We've lost 320,000 farmers to suicide because of debt for chemicals and seeds. It doesn't have to be that way. No farmer needs to sacrifice their life. And I have repeatedly said, this is another form of genocide, where the entire occupation of those who give us food is threatened. The disposition and displacement of small farmers is part of the extinction crisis. Every day in Europe, 1,000 farms are going out of business, not because they were not productive, not because they weren't producing what people need, but because the sick economy of $400 billion annually, $1 million a minute to the wrong sustainable system. Is un and as well as the monopolies in buying 
are making it unviable. We need truth in economy. That's why we do true cost accounting. And our work has shown our members are earning 10 times more than those in the commodity system. The cooperative movement is actually following the laws of nature. It's following the laws of justice. It is following the laws of humanity. And as I found this beautiful little paper in the registration room, United We Are One. And can you imagine how rich and powerful we are? We are more than, I, I don't know, trillions of species on this planet. They used to say 300 million, but it's trillions. We have seven billion people on this planet. There are five billionaires on the other side. They're a sad story for the future. Yours is the real story for the future. Cooperatives are the future. And I want to end by quoting Gandhi on his vision. He said, life will not be a pyramid with the apex sustained by the bottom. It will be an ever expanding, never ascending circles. Till the, at last the whole becomes one life composed of individuals, never aggressive in their arrogance, but ever humble, sharing the majesty of the oceanic circle of which they are integral parts. This is the world we must grow. Thank you. Can we have the mic? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiva, for your keynote address. It was both informative and engaging. Uh, we now have time for probably two questions for Dr. Shiva before we move on to the lunch break. But uh, before we go to the questions, I'd like to make a very small recognition for two very important delegations that we have here today. We have the delegation of Morocco, which is here with us today. And we have the Ministry of Industry and Artisanry from Madagascar. You're both extremely welcome. So let us proceed and then have maybe two questions uh, from the floor that you may want to ask Dr. Shiva. And then we'll conclude the session. Yes, we have one in front, if you can have a mic. If you can tell us your name, maybe your cooperative or your organization. Uh, I'm from Nepal, country of Himalay. Uh, I'm chairman of National Cooperative Federation, Nepal. Uh, uh, Dr. Shivaji have expressed very, very interesting, important, and resourceful issue. But I have some question. How to manage the productivity and hunger? Now, 7.6 billion population of the world. Among them, near about 1.5 billion population are hunger doctor from India. I think 19, at the time of 1970, there was every sector of the crossroad, big board was there, sirp do roti, because if India cannot import from Canada, America, the wheat they cannot feed. You Tell about the Punjab and Haryana Green Revolution at the time, time of Indira Gandhi. Before that, after the Green Revolution in Punjab, Haryana, and including India, they are sufficient in food now, I think. Of course, sometimes before, India today write a 
रिपोर्ट ऑफ इन्वेंशन के नियर अबाउट थर्टी करोड़ ऑफ इंडियन पीपल आर कैनट गेट हैंड एंड माउथ इन ट्वेंटी फोर आवर ओनली वन टाइम थ्री इयर्स बिफोर द रिसर्च हाउ टू मैनेज द हंगर प्रोडक्टिविटी एंड यू टेल अबाउट जी एम ओ एंड अदर थिंग्स and other things the productivity uh, maximum maximum producer of gas emission they are not worry about these things about this also what is your vision i want to learn from you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe can we take a second question yes, and yes. you'll address them at once. Uh, all right, we have a second question here in front. If I may ask you to kindly keep your question short in the Thank interest you. of time. My name Thank is David Bispishi from Egypt. Thank you for a great teacher, lecture, uh, Dr. Chiva. I would like, it is not a question, it's a suggestion. A suggestion in the front of uh, His Excellency, the President of ICA, that our next uh conference should be an title cooperative for the future and to take the future as a dream how to cooperate with each other uh, how do we not could be operated with the environment with the creatures which uh, live with us this is a suggestion thank you so much thank you very much <laughs> I think this yeah. one is more for the ICA president than Dr. Shiva. Dr. Shiva, the floor is yours to answer the question uh, from Nepal. It's actually a question that uh, is a long question and a, would require a long answer to do justice. But if I have to do justice to all of you who are waiting to go to have lunch, I'll briefly um, address some of the key issues. Productivity. Productivity is output per unit input. In an honest calculation, all outputs of any system should be taken into account, and all inputs should be taken into account. If you were to do a productivity analysis of industrial agriculture based on intensive fossil fuels, intensive chemicals, and a lot of capital, it would be negative on financial terms because farmers use 10 times more money to produce than they earn. That's why they're leaving the farms. On energy terms, 10 units of external energy used to produce one unit of calories in the industrial system. Uh, the only reason it works is the only input counted is human labor, which, as, as I said, is wrong for two reasons. Humans are not an input into a system. They are agents in that system. Uh, democratic, happy, free people are an outcome of a good economy. I don't think co uh, cooperatives put humans as inputs in the equation. They're there throughout as agents of responsibility and consciousness, as agents of democracy and participation, not throwaway people. So on any audit, the industrial system actually fails which is why it needs $400 billion annually, they're crutches. You remove these crutches, the system will collapse. Whereas cooperation with nature, farming with nature, cooperation within communities, farmers as collectives, we've created community seed banks, we've created farmers cooperatives in order for them to have a stronger power, in order to decide what the price should be rather than the prices that are constantly collapsing. Uh, those systems are what have worked and will work in cooperatives for the future. That's how they'll work. But they would, I would add one more ingredient. I would basically say, I think the co cooperative movement should consciously say, and we cooperate with nature. Very consciously start declaring we cooperate with nature, we are sustainable. And if changes need to be made, then they make them. I mean, the IFCO group was telling me they're doing organic. They're shifting to organic. 
And any system to be sustainable will have to respect nature, will have to give back to nature. But on the other side, I don't think we can just be producer cooperatives. I think we have to recognize that part of our work is to raise the consciousness of consumers so that they're not just consumers. Because Margaret Thatcher's slogan was, we are just individuals and we are only consumers. No, we are citizens. We are first earth citizens, we are members of our cooperatives, and as citizens, even when you come to buy, you come to buy with consciousness. So just like there's so much consciousness now on the environmental front, we need to show that you can't protect the earth without justice. That ecological justice is the only way forward. Enough for the earth, enough for all people. That's where no one will go hungry. You asked about India. Sadly, I've done a book on this. It's called The Violence of the Green Revolution. It's very detailed in its research. It was done for the United Nations. There was no one dying of hunger in 1965. Nobody. There was no famine in India. There was a drought which raised the prices of wheat, but that meant all the villagers went back home because they had enough food. And that meant these big steel plants, Bilai and all those steel plants, they didn't have labor to build them. So to keep the labor in the cities, they wanted to regulate the price of wheat, which is why the PL480 request was made. But when the PL480 request went with saying, but you must bring chemicals in, and Lal Bahadur Shri Sastri said, I will not experiment with such a large agrarian population. We will do it on a small scale if it works for us. We will. Um, you said now no one's hungry? No, well, now we have famine deaths. Every second Indian child is wasted and stunted. Every fourth Indian is hungry. We've just dropped 112, 102nd on the hunger index, and the last is 112. We are just six above. We are a superpower, we you know, go around muscling everywhere. But if hunger is the measure of how strong or weak you are, we are not doing too well. And yes, there's lots of wheat and rice. But you can't live by wheat and rice alone. You need your dal. And now we're importing fake dal from Canada. 7% protein compared to the 35% protein if we grew it ourselves. And when we grew it ourselves, we also fixed the nitrogen and gave nitrogen to the soil. And now our soils are getting impoverished, our people are getting impoverished. People aren't buying this dal. We're importing 75% of our edible oils because the Green Revolution monoculture meant you grow just a cereal, no oil seeds, no pulses, whereas biodiversity means you have your vegetables, you have your greens, you have your oil seeds, you have your pulses, you have everything that you need. So we are a hugely dependent country now on food imports. And I have watched Africa how the free trade rules turned Africa into a dumping ground by the day, by the day. These are such unequal, asymmetric rules. And I believe that not only should the cooperative movement play a role in defining what development is and saying we are for the future, but I really feel the cooperative movement can and should play a role in redefining rules of trade on the basis of sustainability, justice, and work for all. I say, unless you've protected the last bee, and the last child, and the last forest, you don't have development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiva, for this very inspiring world. I think we have run out of time. I know people may have several questions. I encourage you to reach out to Dr. Shiva and take advantage of her presence after this session to ask your questions. Uh, as we conclude this session, I'd like to invite the ICA president, Mr. Guarco, to kindly share the gift that he has on behalf of the cooperative movement dedicated to Dr. Shiva. You're most welcome, sir.
So once again, a round of applause for Dr. Shiva, our keynote speaker. So as we conclude this session, we have a few announcements to make, just to remind you of the program for the next three days. Uh, let me start with announcing or reminding you that there's a corporate field visit that is organized. If you'd like to take part in this field visit, feel free to go to the reception. The cost is $20 and you can register yourselves. Uh, there are a couple of uh, inspiring case studies or inspiring events that are taking place. Under the Framework Partnership Agreement, ICA has with the European Union at 2.30 today, four parallel sessions focused on gender equality, entrepreneurship inequalities, and fair value chain. So you're most welcome to join these sessions. At 5.30 uh, p.m. tonight, we also have a plenary session on environment, followed by the cinema session. So I don't know when was the last time you watched a movie, but this is a good opportunity to come and have a date with us and watch this very interesting movie. It will be in this main auditorium. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have two plenary sessions on employment and value chains, followed by three parallel sessions on food security, sustainable production, health, and inequalities, as well as housing and energy. You'll see the details in the program, but you're most welcome. And then finally, on Thursday, uh, we'll have a plenary session on peace and equality, I think echoing the opening remarks of um, the ICA president and a grand debate with participants. So that will be used also to close the sessions and have some key recommendations. And then this will be followed by the ICA General Assembly. This is Thursday, and uh, the members of the General Assemblies, of course, are most invited to attend. So once again, thank you all for participating so actively to this opening session. Thank you to our keynote speaker, our guest of honor, and uh, all the panel, the panelists, it was my pleasure to be your MC this morning, and I wish you a great lunch. Thank you.